So perhaps I'll begin by just joining with the angels so that our whole session will be overlit by their love and grace. Now we join with the great healing power of the universe. We join with our own guardian angels. We join with all the angels of healing. And we join with the angels of all the people that will see this video at any time so that they might also receive these blessings. Thank you. My name is Andrew Harvey, and I'm here with my great friend, Jenny D'Angelo. I had the honor to participate a little bit in this extraordinary book, Connect with Your Angels, that I believe is the best and most simple and direct guide to a relationship with the angels that we have. And I cannot stress enough how important this book is and how essential it is for all of us. Jenny, you wrote yesterday in a whirlwind of passion <laughs> what you'd like to get across in our time together, so do read it to us. These are just what immediately came. These words just immediately came. And so this is what I wish you all to know. I have never known the angels to fail. And once you know that you have an angel, you will know this too, and you will know everything will be fine. Me, you, we, we are never alone. I truly mean this, we are never alone. Your angel is holding the light for you now. It has nothing to do with worthiness. Light is the place where your true self rests, and there the angel is with you. Since your first breath, your angel has been with you and knows you so intimately and deeply. So your angel is able to keenly direct every bit of light, every healing, every stream of energy coming to you. Your angel stands above you and can precisely tune the energy mm. so it comes right into your physical body in the precisely right way for what you need right then. And it is exactly right for you and the angels do the timing. When I give them over to the organizing of my day, my day just goes smoothly from the smallest thing to the greatest encounter. It is easy, it is easy, it is easy to send love light energy to anyone, any place, any area of concern. The way I f came to really know about the angels is through my great and beloved person, Dori D'Angelo. We'll talk more about her, but because I was so fortunate to be with her and live with her for a few short years, I saw her sending angel light and blessings. And once you see someone just sending light, it gives you permission to do it. Mm. So you, you, you mm. can do it. This is the really important thing. Ask for help. <laughs> yes. Ask for help and then rely on the support of your angels, knowing that they will be with you. As you begin to discern their influence, your own confidence increases. It's a cumulative effect. The more you talk with your angels, the more you feel them, the more you 
see the effects, the easier it is, the more you do it, the easier it is, and so it continues. It's not really them or it. It's a realm and space of grace. By their grace, they let themselves be seen as we need to see them, perhaps as mm -hmm. a human-like form, with arms, with wings. It's for us that they do this. They could be specks of light, they could be a field of energy, they could be a soft breeze, a fragrance, a flash of light in your peripheral vision. And I want to say that, at least in the beginning, maybe not everyone can see angels, but everyone can see the effects of being with the angels, living with the angels, connecting with the angels in your life. It's rather like electricity or <laughs> magnetism or the wind. We don't actually see electricity. We don't see the wind, but we see the effects. So when we connect with our angels, we see the effects in our lives. Thank you. I love saying those things. I love saying those things. Thank you. What Jenny has just shared with me and you is the distillation of a lifetime's work with the angels. Why I'm so thrilled to be sitting here with my friend is because it was in this house, actually in this room, which has been a place where many, many healings have taken place, that I myself first realized that angels were real, that I myself first felt this total intimate communion, a total intimate communion that has changed my understanding of the universe and profoundly altered my life. So this is my gratitude to you, to do this interview with you, to do this dance with you. Thank you for having introduced me to how simple our relationship with the ambassadors of God, the messengers, the angels, truly can be. I want to invite you to take us in your own time on your journey to the angels. And this journey began, of course, with your birth into a slightly crazy <laughs> and difficult Jewish family. Yes. And you began your life in a lot of distress. Yes. A lot of pain. Yes. A lot of profound difficulty. Yes. Would you share that with us? Because I know so many people who have begun their search with real suffering in their family. I did, and you did. So let's start there. Well, from the place where I live now, it's, it's almost hard to uh, remember how traumatic and disturbing every minute of every day was. And I didn't know about the angels because that wasn't something that was talked about in that environment. There was just terror and brutality and harshness and b bitter hurting. But because things were so hard, I started early to find that there's no one helping me around. My family, my family members, there was no help. There was no support. So it started my, I mean, really, the only place to go was inside. Right. And um, I will say that uh, there was really a small miracle right at the very beginning. Mm. I was born three months premature. I weighed two and a half pounds. <laughs> like it's, a, it's smaller than a half of a Cornish hen. It's not a tiny little, a little thing. And when it happened that I was able to go back into that time and I saw the nurse holding this tiny thing and saying, she can't hope to live. And if she does live, she'll certainly have brain damage. And then I was in an incubator for three months. So the first three months of my life, 
no bonding. And in those days, they didn't pick you up or hold you or talk to you or touch you. You just lay there in this glass box waiting for four mm. drops of milk an hour. Mm. That was my, and the, the loneliness in a certain way is so great. But, jumping around a bit, when I was with my great soul beloved Dory, one of the first things we did was go back into the incubator <laughs> and seeing it through her eyes, seeing it through the angel eyes, I could see that even then in that seeming glass box of isolation, there were so many angels in that incubator that it was in like the incubator, incubator with, with me. <laughs> it's like, the, I mean, we, sa we said, it's like they're like sardines lined up in there and we laughed about it. And what a freeing moment that was for me that even in the most, what seemed to be the most desperate beginning, even then I wasn't alone. Even then I didn't know it, but I wasn't alone. And I'm sure that's why I did live. And not really too much <laughs> brain damage. <laughs> <laughs> of the right kind. Your brain was damaged in a way I wish a lot of other people's brain had been damaged. How did you begin your quest? Because you didn't find any deep spiritual nourishment in your family or any deep support in your family. It was a secular Jewish family yes. in which the many stories of angels in the Bible were never talked about. No. How did you start your own personal quest? By the time I was in high school and then into college, everything was so desperate. I was so lost. And at that time, the country was crazy. And I remember Kent State had just erupted and I had a you know rifle behind my bed. Oh my God. And it, I was crazy. And I knew I was lost and I was so close to suicide mm. and out of some grace out of that trauma I had one friend who had started meditating and I knew that I was completely lost and uh, she was in Berkeley I hitchhiked across the country alone by myself hitchhiked across the country to come to Berkeley and then as soon as I could I started meditating I, I, I knew I had to do something. This beautiful thing was offered, and I jumped on it. How did it work for you? How did it progress? Did you it, immediately Immediately. Connect? The first, you know, in the, in, this was uh, TM, Transcendental Meditation, when it was in its first new beginnings, and it was so pure and clear, and it was the best thing in town. So there, there happened to be one of the first centers in the country in Berkeley went to Berkeley and they do this really beautiful initiation ceremony. And in that first meditation, I had the experience of being completely out my body, way up and around. And I had had that experience as a child a lot, but we, my mother especially, we called it the nightmare. Oh, you're having the nightmare again. <laughs> God, that's helpful, isn't it? You're having a mystical experience yeah, and it's, it's called, called the nightmare. nightmare. So, so there I am, the very first time I'm having this meditation experience, and I'm like 40 miles up above there, seeing my hands way down on my lap. It was such a, I had more peace in those 10 minutes that I, than I had in the, the previous 10 years. So I knew I had to continue, and I did continue. I started, you know, I was a regular meditator. I went to courses. I became a teacher of meditation. Ah. And to make a long story short, I actually became Maharishi's editor of all the wow. British and American publications. So I lived in his ashram and had, you know, an, a, a, a real number of exchanges with him where he trained my mind, mm. how to be clear, reading and, and, and 
trans translating his energy into these words, but it was a profound training and it was a good environment for me. I thrived in the silence and in a way, the, you know, starting my life in an incubator and then being in these in the silent of the ashram right too, and then each of us is in our own little room high in the swiss alps and you know you be in a big room and you're just doing these you know 16 17 rounds of meditation wow. a day f wow. for a long time when i add up all the time that i spent in silence it's more than two years mm. and what that does is that deepens your channel, your, your inner channel of knowing gets ground in and, or now we say the, you know, the prana tube, but at that time it was just going in and being in silence. And then for me having Lord Christ come and Mother Mary come and Lord Krishna come. So I had these beautiful visitations and there was always so much love in the meditations. The environment in the ashram is another whole discussion, but my experiences were how good it is to be alive and have a, a knowing about the inner world. That must have changed everything for you. After all you've been through as a child and experienced as an adolescent, the loneliness and the dislocation, to discover that the self <coughs> is real, that you had an inner beloved, must have shifted your life completely. <laughs> um, I don't know if I will say this next story or not, but I came out of the ashram um, after seven years with a, a lot of blessings from Maharshi and a, a sort of a sense of, you know, yes, you have reached a certain level of enlightenment and you can, you know, go out into the world and whisper the words of eternity to the people by teaching them meditation. So I left the ashram thinking that I would go off into a, a, a cloud of a, glory. A cloud of yes, glory. Yes, you'd be the enlightened one walking. <laughs> now, it never works like that, though, does it? No, oh, God. And I ended up in uh, the community of um, meditators that had just formed in Fairfield, Iowa. I was in. I uh, was soon invited to be part of a new publishing company, and so I got to Iowa. And the first day I was there. Um, there was a man that was um, there doing some research and development for the company, and he sort of saw me, and uh, he sort of had never seen anybody like me, and things <laughs> happened fast. fast. <laughs> <laughs> and in some weeks, he said, you know, basically, uh, I have no right to ask you this, but will you marry me? Will you marry me? Okay. And I really didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to say. I mean, I was at that in those days. I was feeling so much bliss. I can remember going shopping for green beans for dinner, and like every green bean was shining as it wanted to go into my basket. Oh, take me! Oh, take me! Oh, take me! <laughs> I mean, I so going to live with this man and have a life in that energy. I wanted to, ha I was ready to be in, in, in life that way. Uh, and then circumstances happened that we couldn't find a house to rent in Iowa. And so we decided we were just going to get married by the justice of the peace quietly in Iowa. And then he was going to take me back to his wild Marin County, which I didn't even know about <laughs> and everything. I didn't know anything. He was going to take me back because he had, you know, sort of caught this golden bird and wanted to show everybody what he had found. And um, we get out to California. And Marin County at the time was when everybody was having hot tubs and 
peacock feathers and things. And I've been living in an ashram wearing, you know, I mean, it was <laughs> very a, pure and very, quiet. And it was very, very it was very, very amazing. Different. It was a very amazing mm -hmm. cultural exchange, but I wasn't shocked. I could, I felt so confident in my life, really, in my, what I had learned and what I experienced. So we are living in the house for a week. And then <laughs> he wakes up on this Friday morning and he starts walking around the walking around the backyard, walking around the backyard, walking around the backyard. And me in my pure naivete, I say, Oh, you know, my my darling, you know, I, I'm your wife. You can tell me anything. What's going on? And he said, This is all a mistake. Goodbye. No. Just like that. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. So you were married for a week. Right. Well, maybe two weeks by then. You must have been devastated. I just, and, and this wasn't, I mean, yes, I know about stress in the world and everything, but really, this was not what I was <laughs> planning on having as my first week of life in the world. <laughs> God, no. And I didn't have any, who, who, who was I going to call? As it turned out, I had one friend that I knew from the ashram that I remembered was from some place in California. And I called her on the payphone and, I mean, found her number, called her on the payphone and just sobbed on the phone. Oh. And she came, she came every single weekend up to be with me because I completely couldn't function. She said, now we're going to have a breakfast. Now we're going to go for a walk. Now we're going to, I mean, she saved my life. Hmm. And that particular story has another long end to which, which is not appropriate to say here, but she saved my life. And I began to have, I mean, after a year or so, I began to have some life again. So, for instance, you might think, well, you were the editor of, from Maharishi, you could have got a job anytime. So I would have an interview with some big uh, publishing company in San Francisco, and they would say, well, Jenny, um, um, how did you come out to San Francisco? And I would burst out crying. <laughs> Poor darling, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's often these kinds of personal oh, catastrophes wow. that presage a huge breakthrough. Well, how else and that's what happened, would isn't I it? Would I ever have come to meet Dory? Exactly, and how else would you have been Broken sufficiently enough. flayed open yes. to receive what this amazing woman gave yes. you. Yes. yes. You yes. must now tell us about Dory because it's very difficult to describe Dory, but she was the great pioneer of Absolutely. the angel Absolutely. phenomenon. Yes. And she was an authentic, connected one yes. and a great secret healer oh. who's legend yeah, yeah. has spread throughout California the world. and yet remained a totally yes. simple person. Yeah. Yes. So yes. tell us the story of how you met Dory because and what happened to you through and with Dory. Mm. I wish to God I'd known her because all I have is a photograph of her but I have it very close to me every day and just looking at that face mm -hmm. bursting into a smile of the purest most childlike joy yes, yes. and she's old. Yes you realize, oh my God, this woman truly knows, knows in every part of yes. her being that yes. the angels yes. are real, yes. that they're here, yes. that you can connect to them, that they have immense powers of healing, and it's all so simple. There's nothing absolutely. pompous about it, nothing grandiose about it. Absolutely. It's perfect. Yes, absolutely. So please, tell us about Dory. Evoke Dory for us. Two friends of mine happened to hear about her, and they knew instantly, somehow, that they had to tell me. They had to tell me about her, and just her name and her phone number. And without even knowing what that meant, I called her up. And her. And she was in Carmel, wasn't she? She was in Carmel. I was in Marin, northern, uh, uh, just north of San Francisco, and Carmel is two hours or so south along the coast. Um, 
So she answered the phone in her soft, beautiful voice and said, Hello, <laughs> this is Dory. <laughs> and I said, I don't even know what a healing is. I don't even know why I'm calling. And she said, Oh, that happens a lot. The angels are <laughs> arranging something. <laughs> And she made, we, she made an appointment for me for that Saturday, even though she didn't usually have appointments on Saturday. And I drove down to Carmel, and her house had a little white picket fence around it. And when I opened the gate of the white picket fence, I knew that I was walking into magic. And the next, I knew it was utterly right to be there. My calling was to be there. And she opened the door. She was 81. God. 81. She had skin as pure as a cloud. And she had a nimbus of just white hair. And just to see her, I, I just walked right into her heart, right there at the door. Wow. And we came in and we sat down and we held hands. And I began to tell a little bit about myself. Um, I didn't have, I wasn't coming for a physical healing, but I was coming for emotional su support. And we went into the angel room, and I lay down on the table, and she brought in the angels. And I saw everything that she was talking about. You saw it with I, your heart, I could, mind's eye. I, you I could, could see it see. literally. I mean, and she and I were What did you see? Well, at the at the beginning, it's it just my sight was just sort of orbs and swirls of light. As I began to be with her and work with her, they became more discreet. I could see colors and I could see swirls and I could see how things were going. But in the first, it was just the the orbs of light and the profound safety and love. When she was talking about how the angels love me, I mean, mm. I remember in the middle of my session, I'm just sobbing because my heart is just cracked open by this profound love that I, that I, I, I couldn't have imagined yet. Here I was having it in the best, in the best possible way, in the best possible company. And you'd never experienced love like that. You hadn't experienced it from your mother. This man had left after a week. You'd been very solitary in your quest. So there must have been a part of you that couldn't possibly believe that such absolutely free, immense love was given, just given. But because Dory was so pure and simple and believable. There wasn't an ounce of falseness. There was nothing that, there was no place to doubt. And I knew she was called the Angel Lady of Carmel. She was really mm. the first angel. And as I say, in 1981, no one was talking about angels. The great angels. angel boom, this terrible commercial new age boom hadn't started. Hadn't started. And so she was the first person that spoke about them being down here in the mainstream. And she really wanted people to know that they weren't just fluttering things with harps, that they were really, I mean, you, you want to use the word solid, but it's sort of like, like solid made of light. of light. I mean, they're really, they're solid, solid light. It's hard, you can't say how it is, but they're, they're strong and they're purposeful. purposeful. They have missions. Yes. They want to help you. That's all they want to do is love us and help us and support us and guide us and comfort us and hold us and help us be the best, 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 best that we can be. Absolutely. And how did you continue to work with? Uh, there were so many people in the town that loved Dory. So there was always somebody that had a room that you could stay. That I could mm. stay, and so I would stay this room for a month, and this room for two months, and this room for a year, and and go over to Dory's every day, walking into her house. There wasn't there wasn't anything that we couldn't do. In the beginning, I answered the phone, and then I learned how to write uh, letters back to people because she got letters from people all over the world. 
uh, then she started uh, wanting me to be sitting with her when she would be interviewing the people so that I could just, she wanted me to be there for everything. And then after a, a very short time, she wanted me to be in the healing room. Right. So she would be holding, having her hands on the person's head and she'd have her tape recorder in her lavalier on and she'd turn the tape recorder on and I would be at the foot of the healing table and the two of us made, together with the angels made such a resonant field mm -hmm. that in that field just profound profound healings happened. What kind of healings did you witness yourself personally? I witnessed, well some of them I, I witnessed the session and then I heard the results as the people wrote, like a bone grew back, mm -hmm. someone is suddenly out of the hospital in a day, <laughs> uh, tumors gone, uh, bur burns easy, asthma, things like asthma uh, easy, I don't, I don't want to say it too much, but really, there, a lot of people, of course, came with emotional uh, yearnings and the quality of peace mm. that they received and then experienced. So the way the healings work, at the end of the session, the healing is complete on the etheric. And if the person allows, it precipitates down into their body, into their cells. And their instruction is to go home and play the tape every night so that their cells remember again and again and again. And people just had healing. She was written up in, um, I mean, David St. Clair wrote a book called um, you know, the best healers in America or something like that. The 10 best healers in America or something. And she, she was, was one of them. She was one of them. And in a certain way of saying, she, we had a like 95% success rate. Gosh. Wow. People came out of desperation. They had already tried everything. So they had nothing else to lose. And they came and then they were just open and they, she was so pure and so unconditional and so kind and so simple. You're so blessed to, to work with a real master. Really? Because really. anyone who's ever told me about Dory, and many people have talked to me about her, they all say exactly the same thing ah, about as you do. That's so wonderful. What did you get from her? Because she really adopted you as her successor, didn't she? She adopted she me. She wanted you to carry yes. on her work. She yes. trained you mystically. Yes. And well, by the, her what presence, she, didn't she she let me she later told me that when she saw me standing at the door. Wow. That first time, she said she knew that this was who the, she'd been praying for 20 years for someone. I mean, she had people coming. I mean, there were people that came and learned from her and that, but nobody stayed and nobody stayed and nobody really was there with her all the time like I was. And she said, I knew that you were the one that the angels brought to me. And also that we found that we were in such resonance. We would walk down the street. We were the same height. We had the same little hands. <laughs> we would go gliding into Carmel. And she said, she felt my, you know, sort of youth and strength and vitality. Supporting and sustaining her. her. Yes. And I felt her wisdom just coming in wow. to me. So in, in um, I mean, really exactly on my, just the same day as today is, in 1983, we decided to make our kinship uh, sanctified. So she adopted me as granddaughter next of kin, which is the way that many spiritual traditions go. They, you know, alternate generations. So on that day, I became Jenny D'Angelo, mm. the most honorable thing that could happen to me, to be 
invited into her lineage. And then, f four months later, that was in September, in November, she had an embolism, mm. and they got it out, but those few days in the hospital really were impacting on her, and when she came home, she decided she was ready to live with the angels full time. Mm. And um, I'm not going to go into um, some of the things that happened, but I will say this most most, most profound gift that she gave me. In the last days, we just had beautiful music playing and people came to mm -hmm. be in the room and it was really, really soft, gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. And I was actually holding her in my arms when she took her last breath and I saw the angels. So I, the saw, angels take I saw her, her take her out. Wow. And for an instant of an instant, she let me go with her. Mm. So, sort of like, there, there is a there, even though it's not a place. It's a pl energetic it's a placement. It's mm. a realm. But it's absolutely real. And I cannot tell you what it means to know that. To know that, to know that, it takes away every fear of death. In fact, I'm, in a way, looking forward because there I will be and there she will be and at some time. I'm not ready yet, but I know the there of there. And that was one of the great gifts that she gave me. You've talked to me many times about her, and I think the deepest gift that she gave you is the gift that runs through your great book, Connect With Your Angels. And that is a vision that avoids the two main difficulties that visions of angels have had. One difficulty has been that angels have treated us so exalted and extraordinary that people feel they can't possibly have an intimate relationship mm. with them. And the other is the opposite difficulty, which is marred and stained so yes. much of the commercial new age yes, appropriation yes. of angels, which is that angels are really just like bus boys or bus girls just there to do whatever you want. So there's no sense in the second vision of any right. tender, intimate, awestruck, awe, reverent and relationship. And but what Dory gave you was the relationship that's authentic with the angels. Yes. It's not that they're so exalted that you can't have a relationship with them, nor is it that they're just around to do your bidding. You are here to have the amazing experience of realizing that, yes, your guardian angel is real, and that experience engenders such awe, such reverence, such trust, that you learn how to surrender to the angel and be guided by your angel in a way that suffuses your whole life with much deeper divine presence and joy. Absolutely. And that is why I was so drawn to your vision, because it didn't isolate people through awe, and it didn't give people this dreadful New Age feeling that everything in the divine is just a kind of ATM which you draw on whenever you want, which is a disgraceful and blasphemous vision. So in these years since Dory's death, what have you truly been doing? What is your work in these years? What do you see your book as helping people to? What do you see your work as being? Well, uh, one of the things that has been so remarkable for me to notice in these intervening years is that Dory was so ahead of her time because one of the things that she said was they're, they're, the angels are waiting in the unemployment line <laughs> if you're not talking to them. Because we live in a free will universe, they cannot intervene. I mean, maybe if your car is going over a cliff or something, but generally they can't intervene if you don't ask. And if just saying, 
thank you, angels, for being with me today. If that's all that it takes to have your life be made better in every possible way, how could I be so arrogant as to not do that? Thank you, angels, for being with me. Thank you, angels, for being with us right now. Thank you for being around us as we speak about you so that you infuse our words with your light so that everything we say is infused with your light. And it's that easy and it's that simple and it's that natural. It's natural to talk with your angels. It's easy, you say, but it does require a huge leap. It requires the leap that you can believe that you are lovable at that deep level. One of the things we talk about a lot is how many people resist coming to know their angel because they simply can't believe, because of their experience, that they could be loved that much, that unconditionally, that purely, that blissfully. They simply can't believe it. And it takes time. I find that myself to believe in the depth of God's unconditional love for me. But it's a, it's a, it, again, it's a cumulative thing. But Dora used to say, just, just give yourself seven days. You don't have to believe, but just let yourself talk with your angel like it's your best friend. Say, well, I'm not sure what I'm really thinking, but it feels nice to talk with you, and so this is what I'm. This is how I am now, and you know, uh, it would be great if this meeting that I have this afternoon goes smoothly. So, okay, angels, I'm asking for your help in this, and that my my you know my child is um, uh, having a, a test tomorrow afternoon. Thank you for helping my my child do well. You just that you just say the things that are in your real heart and in your real life. And if you do that for seven days, seven days, there will absolutely be things that, that you notice. Uh, you're, you're, you're reminding me of something that I, I feel is so important. When you say out a prayer, when you say out a wish, when you say out your yearning, then you only have to be aware to have your eyes open for when the answers start happening. Somebody says something, or even, you know, there's a, a song on the radio that has a right. certain a line synchronicity or something, which guides you into and, a you, new direction. And, you, and you have to pay attention to these small things because these small things are how the angels first whisper to you. They're not gonna appear in your room the first day. You'd be too frightened, but just some little, <laughs> Oh, well, that felt good. Well, that feels like the answer to my question. Oh, that really, oh, that does feel good. Oh, you know, maybe I'll do this another day. Maybe, may, and when I lie down at night, maybe I'll just talk with my angel about how the day went. And, uh, and it starts feeling better, and then so you feel better, and then you have more little uh, seeds or breadcrumbs or uh, followings so that your own trust in your own discerning comes out. Your confidence grows. And then quietly, you, you maybe you're having lunch with your friend and you say, well, you know, I'm doing the strangest thing. I'm talking to my angel and it somehow feels better. And then your friend says, well, maybe I can do that too. You know, just in tiny little ways, the angels are always telling me to use the word angels so that people get used to saying it comfortably and easily. You can say light, you can say love, you can say love light. It's all the same. God's spark of pure creative uh, source, all of those things. But most people in the world are easy with saying angels. And so... It's easy to say, it's easy to talk about, it's natural, it's so, it's so lovely. And I mean, for me, after a while, after a while, after a while, all their loving on me, loving on me, loving on me, I really began to feel lovable. Me, wretched, miserable child girl that I was back in Crap City in Massachusetts. <laughs> and me, 
out of all these strange things, I could be lovable? And not in an abstract way. No, People talk but, about being loved by God, but what's so exquisite about the relationship with the angels is that that angel is there just for, for you. you. And you have, knows you intimately, intimately. unjudgmentally. Absolutely. So you have this miracle of an intimate relationship with the spark of the Godhead, Godhead. that is trained personally on you for your, your, your life. life. This is a mind-boggling grace and mercy, isn't it? Well, that, that's the, you know, it's so big and yet... So intimate. It's so close. It's so close and so unfailing, unwavering support, unfailing love. It, it's amazing. It's amazing. Remember when we were talking about your life about six years ago and how you were doing healings and how people came to you and found you because you don't advertise you don't put yourself out there you're not interested in that kind of show you follow dory's path of being yes. humble and simple and cloistered and found by people rather than yes. spectacularly out there yes. in any boring yes. way and you said that one of the things you wanted to do before you left was to write a book because you wanted to get to as many people as possible mm. with the clarity and purity of what's possible in relationship with angels because you saw a world burning in crisis. You saw people feeling paralyzed by despair and fear you saw people absolutely exhausted and you wanted to reach out to everyone who could hear and say, you don't have to be paralyzed, you don't have to doubt, you don't have to feel alone. Because if only you can connect with your guardian angel, your guardian angel will guide you and teach you and empower you and open protective, beautiful ways for you and you will understand viscerally that what God wants for you is to flower completely yes. in the core of your life and this will give Absolutely. you so much joy and Absolutely. so much hope and so much energy even in this obviously completely crazy world Absolutely. and that's out of that inspiration came your wonderful book connect with your angel what was the experience of writing the book like because I remember, <laughs> but I would love you to <laughs> describe it to others because it was a very strange and wonderful thing to be part of because the book grew through these sacred conversations yes. that you had, that I had with you, that you had with the angels. Well, it was, it, thank you, thank you. Because at the time, and you were the person who charged me and you can't, you can't just wiggle away under that. When Andrew Harvey says, you know, what you said to me, and I, I hope I'll say this, but you said. I hope I didn't swear. No, no, no. You had just done this extraordinary roomy transmission in this garden, and it was such a beautiful evening, and you had transmitted roomy to us in such naked perfection. It was astounding. And then as you do sometime you wanted to leave right away and I was your uh, driver and we sat in my car and bef as I put my key in you took my hand and you said well you were still in the 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 bigness of what you had just transmitted you said mm -hmm. you said I have seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people and you are the real deal and you must write this angel book. Oh God. <laughs> you, and you can't, you can't, you can't like, well, I, I'm busy and I, uh, you know, you, 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 I, there was nothing I could do but, but start. And even though I thought I knew a lot about angels and I had a lot of experience, it brought me to a whole new level of trust mm. in them and in our connection because every day I sat, I just, you know, had a prayer and a meditation, started my pencil and wrote these 
found at the end of the, my pencil is at the end of the page, and this astounding message in the beginning, how to write and how they were telling me to not be afraid. I already have everything I need. They are with me all through it. They are 100% behind this project. They really want this work to go out. That the, the, the pages, as they, the pages began to accumulate, the pages were actually lit with light. Mm. So that even though this is a published book and it's produced... It's like a book of light and it, so many people have been transformed the, by the, it. The, the light comes off of the Absolutely. words in the pages. How is that possible? But it's true because mm. they were blessing this whole project and the messages are so beautiful. I can only say that because in a way I feel I didn't write this book. I just held the pencil. So I must, I, mean, I just... But your passion for words, your training with Maharishi, your wonderfully clear mind, because I know you well and how very, very clear your intellect is and how passionately precise your intellect is. And that combination is ideal for the kind of work you're yes. doing because yes. you had been prepared in all yes. of these yes. different yes. ways yes. to yes. be yes. Yes. the surrendered instrument. Yes. And you knew yes. that and you re... Yes claimed it again and again because there were many times when I would ring you and you'd say I don't know whether I'm getting it absolutely right I'm so worried that I'm in any way falsifying it and you'd ask the angels and they'd reassure you so that's a relationship that gave birth and to And their people. love was is was and is and always is so like you just say the word love, but all the flavors, you know, this kind of love this day and this kind of support this day and this kind of encouragement this day so that everything I love felt what you say because that's exactly what you said right at the beginning, that what the an your angel does is tune the blessings and healings come to you just to you. And only so your angel can aspect. do that even. Yes. I mean, when you see them, sometimes they're like... It's just right, you know, it goes right where it needs to go, and it's, it's so remarkable. It's so remarkable. I'd love to read one passage if mm, I can mm, find mm. it. It's the passage, I don't know if you could help me find it, on the body and the angels. Because oh, the one of the beautiful things that happened was that I got to be able to ask questions that I'd oh, been very deeply concerned about. Yes. of the angels, and they would give the most astonishing direct answers. And I'd love to read that passage on the transformation that I believe is happening on the earth at the moment. I believe we're in a massive evolutionary shift, which is giving birth to an embodied it. divine humanity. And I asked that of the angels. Do you remember the message? I'll look on it. You know, I'll use the old-fashioned thing called the index. Oh my God, an index. The question I asked the angels is a question that deeply possessed me ever since I first encountered my guardian angel in this room. We have been told a great birth of an embodied divine humanity is the evolutionary destiny of humanity. What is the role of the angels in this great birth? Not inconsiderable question. This is what they answered. When the angelic beings, ones from the angelic realm, are fully invited, consciously embraced in a human life, the quality of that person's life immediately begins to change. It used to occur slowly. Now, the old timelines do not apply. You will never go back to that protracted and habitual functioning. The time for slow growth is past. So including the angels in your thoughts and prayers and your consciousness is more like eating light. The angel's constancy is a portion of the food you and your body hunger for. The great central sun and our many allies from the star nations have been pouring light upon earth. The cetaceans are grounding this light in the oceans. You, as awakening humans, are grounding light into your Mother Earth. This is very important. And once your angel is allowed entry by you 
into your energetic field. Your angel, who knows you so well, is able to keenly direct the light as it enters your physical body. Dory says it this way, you don't think, you just accept as the angel pours the great healing light into every part of you. The subtle energy channels are infused with light. Your cells transform so the structures become crystalline. It is impossible to operate in a rigid or a habitual way. You can only be flexible, humble and grateful as you cook, cook, cook. <laughs> Do not be afraid. This is what we have all been waiting for. Imagine our love when we are able to infuse and direct these healing flows in each of your bodies in precisely the way to heal you completely and bring you to full consciousness. As each individual says yes out loud in a whisper, in a thought, in the heart space, the fullness comes. Then you will see that you have all finally and at last said yes. This is the new earth rising. Mm. And then this amazing sentence, which really confirmed everything that I and myself have been discovering and everything that the great evolutionary mystics have been telling us. The company of heaven says, our sacred purpose is to unfold the divine plan through physicality. Through physicality through experiencing the beloved, the angels, the light in the body and so changing everything and justice. acting everything. from that consciousness to establish a world of justice and peace. Astounding. That's the plan, isn't oh, it? So astounding. It's so astounding and it's so simple and it's a universal plan. It yes. goes beyond religion. Yes. The angels are part of the architecture of the universe. Yes. They're known in every mystical yes. tradition. They're not necessarily Christian or Islamic. Of course not. They belong to the Godhead. And they are available to everyone. And in this great, huge transformation that we're in, an evolutionary transformation, <sighs> having them there for us is of inestimable grace and beauty. How amazing. Oh, we could go on forever and ever, <laughs> but it would be wonderful if you could just complete this lovely conversation by sharing some practices, sharing anything you'd like to really help us go deeper into the relationship that you know is all transforming and that I know. Uh, well, I, 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 I'd like to read um, or share a very, very, very simple, simple practice that anyone can begin with. Mm. It's just a, a, just a, a sweet energy healing. So one angel at you're in your you're in your bed at night one angel at your head, two angels at your feet, mm. and they hold a clear field of clear light, pure light potential. And this field and your sleeping self by their presence, you and your energetic field come into resonance. This great energy field and your sleeping self come into resonance. The whole field is perfectly balanced and energized for your precise needs. Then the angels draw this resonating field down into your sleeping body. And this gives you energy that is quantified by light. Your cells respond like golden fish swimming in a luminescent pool. Everything is well. Everything 
is peaceful. Everything is set right. Mm. One of the aspects of your teachings I love so much is that it's not just about your relationship with your angel for your life. Mm -hmm. You also get to have the sublime fun of sending light oh, to others and sending angels to others. Yes. Nothing is more fun in the real mystical oh, path than so knowing true. that through your intention and deep sacred thought, you can do a little good to someone else who may never know it. It's having fun like that that it's the so, angels allow you yes. to enjoy, isn't it? I'm Tell us about I'm sending I'm so light. glad you asked that because it's so simple, so basic, and so profound. If you will... And so naughty uh, in the best sense, isn't if it? If you will allow me... <laughs> to read again, because even though I know these things, the angel's words are so precisely perfect. So I will read this beautiful page, sending light, mm. sending light. And for me, mm. just put up my hand, sending light. Mm. And we're sending light yes. to all of you, yes. my friends. Yes. 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 Sending light. It is a beautiful practice to send light. Your sight expands when you send light. You will begin to feel it in the palms of your hands when you send light. Then you might see the soft light around that person's head. It's not your business. This is very important. It's not your business what happens, whether the person receives it or not. Just send the light. As your field expands, you will see more light activation. Mm. The light draws to itself adamantine particles of light. So light attracts more light. The news is in the sending. The power of the sending is a mystery to explore. As the sender, you are intermingling with being bathed in glorious, holy, familiar light. I love that. Sending people, sending light to people is easy. See the angels with them. Don't make it complicated. Just send light. It is in the sending of angels that the power manifests. The power multiplies, amplifies by the act of sending. You may have been taught that light and love are different, but in this case, light and the angels and love are the same. Light and love and angels, they are God's pure messengers, God's personal gift. Mm. Just say it, just click it, just start it, and it is there. The whole thing happens just by sending light and how you feel you have nothing to do with what happens all you do is send you can send to people that are under storm watch people that are in a city of distress you can send to the angel of that place and then that angel particularizes the gift of the light that you have sent to be its most useful in the most many ways that it can be. It's so astounding. And all you do is feel better and better and better, stronger and stronger and stronger, and then you send more. And it's in your little house. You can be the, 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 the sender of light yes. to the, the world. And isn't this a wonderful thing to do when you're watching the news? I, so many exactly. people say to me, I, am, I can't watch the news, it's so appalling, it's so depressing. No, watch the news in a state of contemplation yes. and connection with your angel and send light, send light to all the people suffering, every, all the animal suffering, all the difficulties that are 
I, I've, I've especially been doing this recently in Syria, just, just yes. seeing what the Syrian refugees are going through has nearly paralyzed my heart, but I remembered to send light in the name of the angels, and that gave me the courage mm -hmm. to watch and it gave me the courage to consider how to act. Yes, that's so true. We could talk for hours, my friends, but I hope you've had a taste of Jenny's passion, Jenny's clarity, Jenny's wisdom, and this sublimely simple and massively encouraging vision mm -hmm. that the angels are trying to bring us to help us be strong and hopeful and joyful and in secret tender bliss, even in appalling times, so that we can truly, okay. truly work with the great light plan to birth a new divine humanity. Please read Jenny's extraordinary book, Connect oh, with Your Angels. Hold up angels. this picture because I love this Blake. The Angels in the Sepulchre. I have been in this room and had one of the most profound experiences of my life in the very room that Blake envisions in this. So... That's the room of the resurrection. Yes. Right. So beautiful. We bless everyone that's watching, everyone that's open to receive this quiet, pulsing glory that's available. May it be so. And may everyone who has taken this journey with us be inspired to be brave enough to open up a relationship with their angel so that they too can taste what Jenny knows and what Jenny has helped me know. God bless you. Thank you so much.